Friends of British uh, Columbia Archives. Um, first of all, I'd like to raise my hands in thanks and respect in acknowledging the Lekongwen uh, peoples on whose territory I visit today and the Lekongwen and Wasnak uh, peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue. So, haichika. Um, I've been asked to speak about menus and one of the things about menus is, as Jesse had commented, all of you eat. All of you have gone to a restaurant, which means you've seen a menu. And I come to my collecting as in part because I am the daughter of a restaurateur. So, so one of the things that I've come to know I've met so many different people and they're in all different facets of careers and not necessarily in the restaurant business. But when you talk to them and say, oh yeah, you know, my uncle had a restaurant or my you know, aunt was connected to a restaurant, more often than not, they have a menu. That menu is part of the memory of their particular establishment. But in my case, yes, I am, as I say, the daughter of a restaurateur, but thanks to my uncle and my father, menus are my inheritance. And so, and I'm not even 100% sure, was I collecting menus before I got this set of menus or was it the other way around? In any case, I've been co collecting menus for quite some time. So these menus have been shown previously in a museum of Vancouver exhibit all together now. And it was basically on for almost uh, a year, 2016 to 2017. And part of that collecting is, I also realize I collect other things. So, so for the Zoom people, I, I am wearing my takeout Chinese earrings. So, at some point I realized I was collecting food earrings and some of them are related to Chinese food. So it's not like stamp or coin collecting. It's very clear that you're collecting those things. But as I said, I started collecting and said, oh, I have a collection. And then of course it's like, oh, what am I gonna do with that collection once I disappear from this earth kind of thing? But. One of the things about uh, being in uh, a restaurant connected family is it's always around you. So in this photograph is my mother. I don't know 100% whether that's me, but why would my mother be looking so fondly at some other kid, right? Um, so, so one of the things, so part of what I'm doing is giving you the context Menus are, it's a piece of paper, it's got a bunch of information. What does it really mean? It means something to people, right? So when you put it into context, it's much more than just, oh, I can get chop suey or chow mein or whatever that food is. So it is about family and friends, it is about events, and it's also about a particular time and place. So as I said, my inheritance really stems from my uncle and my father. So in the heyday of Vancouver's Chinatown was from the 50s, 60s into the 70s. So that is when, at least for my uncle, he collected menus. So I am blessed with these particular menus. So I'm in the photograph. I won't tell you which one, but this is my family, and it's in one of the rooms of the WK Gardens. So the WK Gardens is a restaurant that is associated with my family. So if you are from Vancouver and again, particular time and place, and you said WK Gardens, it would resonate with so many different peoples. So this was where, quote unquote, I grew up outside of my, my neighborhood. So when there was something we would go to the restaurant for a variety of different celebrations. So weddings were a common thing. So, so one of the things about 
so I, I tend to focus a lot on the WK Gardens because I would say that I probably have the largest collection of venues specific to WK. So here you see that there's a specialty menu. It's uh, 1967. And then there's a photograph of a menu, not a menu, but an invitation, but it says that the dinner is gonna be held at the WK Gardens. And I guess because, because so much time has passed since the acquiring of the Wanda and David Ng uh, menu, it's from 67, you think, do they have kids? Who, 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 who of their family is out there that might have this in their collection? So this is that other thing. Because specialty menus were created, they tend to reside in people's families' personal collections of memorabilia. And here are other occasions, all of them from the WK. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of items. So the two in red. So so the, the one on your, okay, my right side, your left, uh, is, it says 1949. It's the Chinese Freemasons. And it actually has the name Mrs. Kenneth uh, Drury. I had to look up, well, one, I figured, hmm, not Chinese going to a Chinese Freemasons event, given the, the year 1949. And I thought, oh, that family must be important. So thanks to Google, I looked up uh, Kenneth Drury. Kenneth Drury was a notable journalist in Victoria and Vancouver. So that says something about relationships that the misses was invited to the um, Chinese Freemasons. The other item, red, I, okay, red colored menu is, it says the Vancouver Sun's dinner. And the dinner is specifically for the Canadian Women's Press Club. So think about how many uh, non-Chinese were experiencing a particular kind of Chinese food, again, in a particular place and time. And so the other thing to note about the menu, so they're, part of the menus are, they're specially printed, right? The other thing is that for this particular uh, menu, it says there was a fashion show. So again, it's conveying culture. Right, so it's not just about food. And again, you could debate about what kind of food is being transmitted as culture. But again, I'm saying time and place, we need to think about the context in which these foods are being presented. The other one is the Lions Club. So you get to see the associations of community within one restaurant, because like I said, this is from uh, the WK Gardens. Um, I've got here a number of ads from the Chinatown News. Um, and the one thing to note about Chinatown News is it started in 1953 and it was, um, the publisher was Roy Ma. So he's a quite a notable individual uh, from uh, Vancouver. So when you see these advertisements, you recognize that the restaurants are portraying themselves in a particular way. Uh, and, and the use of what I would say outdated language, because you see amidst oriental splendor, right? I don't think anybody would use the term oriental today. Um, and it says for Sai Wu, all tourists welcome. So who, who is this being marketed to, right? So you're marketing to a local uh, community, but also outside beyond. And here are some of those restaurant menus. So the only one that's not from Vancouver is Golden Dragon and it's uh, in Burnaby. So one of the things about 
uh, the menus and one can have a lot of conversation about menus is their presentation and the kind of language being used. So I'm not gonna deal with that because that could be another talk. But I do wanna show you some special menus. JD Eaton menu. How many of you remember Eaton's department store? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm looking at an older crowd. So, so Eaton's department store was a big deal. JD Eaton was the fourth president of Eaton's. So this, this was, uh, so the menu is really interesting because I fortunately uh, had the opportunity to ask my father about it. You know, because a lot of time when you're growing up, what your parents do, you don't pay attention because they're your parents. Why would you listen to your parents, right? And you wouldn't necessarily ask those important questions. So for whatever reason, I did ask him about this menu. And he said at the time, 1959, Eaton's, you know, Eaton's wanted to spend $50 per person on the menu. So think about it, 1959, $50 per person. And it was like, oh, what are we going to serve $50 a person? So that's why the menu on, on this side is so extensive and so elaborate. So that little piece of knowledge, knowing that how much was being spent tells you something. The other thing is who the, the okay, part of it is location. So again, I did not know who CBK Van Norman is. Anybody know? famous architect. So, so um, he actually was a part of the Park Royal development. So it's that kind of big architect, right? So, so think about it. It's Eaton, famous architect, and the launching, historically speaking, is significant. It's Matsumoto shipyards. Matsumoto no longer exists, right? And so if you look up about Sam Matsumoto, he was one of the people incarcerated during uh, World War II. And he was from originally from Prince Rupert. He came, uh, he returned to the coast to set up his shipyard, right? So, so this document alone tells you lots about the significance of the WK Gardens in terms of restaurants and, you know, how restaurants or Chinese restaurants in Vancouver's Chinatown were perceived by the larger public. And then this one. Yeah, the prime minister <laughs> came to WK Gardens, again, a special menu. And if you look at the names, you know that uh, the individuals are significant. Um, you have, Arthur Lang, right? We know that name. Uh, John Nickel. So you've got MPs, notable politicians, and the most notable, Pearson, right? And I guess one of the other things to sort of comment about um, menus is that if you're a politician, and you know, even today, if you're a politician, you go to all the ethnic restaurants for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, so even so, so, so when you think about the context of this menu and how it was a special one, it just sort of makes you realize how important uh, Chinese restaurants were to Canadians in general to be seen in them. And just in brief, I wanted to point out this one. So this, I had already shown you this, is the Golden Dragon. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, the sort of naming of men, uh, restaurants and sort of the iconography. But for yourselves, think how many, no matter where you have lived or currently live, how many rest, Chinese restaurants have the word dragon in it or golden, one or the other? So it says something, and how many have the 
what I call, okay, it's being called the chop suey script, you know, golden dragon, it's supposed to uh, imitate brush strokes. Those are signifiers. So you don't, as, as soon as you see a dragon or the, as I say, the chop suey iconog iconography, you know you're at a particular kind of restaurant. It's a Chinese Canadian restaurant. So this is the oldest uh, menu that I have. And it was part of my uncle's uh, collection. So I had looked up in the business directory that uh, WK or WAQ was listed from 1920 to 26 on 96. And then in 27, it went to 127 East Pender. So my recollection of growing up is at the 127 East Pender Street. So that was the uh, main location. What is interesting about this particular menu, let me backtrack. WQ or WK is significant. So I will say that I don't know enough Cantonese or Chinese in general to save myself, but I do know that WK stands for WQ, and that means overseas Chinese. So here you have the labeling, overseas Chinese, and it's a restaurant. So in Chinese, you would say WQ Lao, which is you know overseas Chinese restaurant. So WQ is meaningful if you know something about the language. But the fact that this is anywhere from you know late uh, 1920s, it's in English. How many people who are of Chinese descent would, would know English at that point in time? Not very many, which means who are they catering to, right? So, so people were going to Chinese restaurants very, very early on. And one of the things that I like to also point out about this menu, in the bottom corner are the different types of tea that you can get. So, so you know, when you go to a Chinese restaurant, they say, you want tea? You just get the tea. But back then, there was, one might say, a connoisseurship of tea because you could select so, you, so my feeling is when I go to a Chinese restaurant today and they ask me what kind of tea I want, I know they're a step above the sort of standard Chinese Canadian restaurant because Chinese Canadian restaurant, it's probably just green tea that they're gonna give you. But when you go to another place and they give you two or three choices, it's like, ah, I know what I want, right? So this is a very early, like I said, an early one. So when I was asked to give this talk, uh, I expressed that I didn't think there were very many menus in the uh, BC archives, but there was this in the BC archives. And you can see that I put a little arrow, Chinese food recipes, okay? So this catalog is, dates from, it says 1951-52. So what did I just say about sort of the heyday of Chinese Canadian foods, 50s, 60s, 70s? If you have a catalog like this, that means because it's importer, <laughs> exporter, they're sending this catalog out to all those little teeny tiny places. You want dishes, you want, you know, whatever. Here, I've got it in this catalog. And, and by the way, I've got recipes in it. If you're not quite sure about how to cook, because today we get to look on the internet. We get to YouTube all of those uh, recipes that we thought we knew, but we weren't quite 100% sure. So this catalog had 16 meat recipes. It had three for soup, five for poultry, four for seafood, and even a how-to on how to boil rice. Like, what more could you ask for? So... Part of this is, if this is going out, so so when people immigrated, they weren't always thinking, oh, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna open a Chinese restaurant, or 
I want to work in a Chinese restaurant, two different things. But if you have something with recipes and you have this memory of the food, you, you can then start to create what those foods are. So, so these are quote unquote, some of the famous recipes. And what I liked about this is each recipe has the Chinese phonetic pronunciation. So remember too, that in this time frame people spoke either Toisonese or Cantonese. They did not speak Mandarin. So this, this is one of the things that I always point out because you have people who are not from here and they know Mandarin and Mandarin is their language. And then they start translating things and it's like, I don't know what that's it. You know, like they transliterate it into Pinyin. The... <laughs> the sounds are totally different. So they will be referencing something you think, I don't know what that is. But when I, in my bad Cantonese pronounce these, it's like, oh, I know exactly what these things are, even though I don't read it. So like the bottom one, ho yao, now fan. So fan is, is rice, now is beef, ho yao is oyster. So it resonates with me in a particular way. So thinking about that early migration, these are foods that touch the heart. They, they remind you of home. And one of them uh, that's listed there, um, do I have it up there? No, I don't have it up there. But one is, um, in English, they refer to it as steam pork burger, and it's uh, jing yuk biang. And for me, that is a home-style comfort food. Um, so here you have recipes that are available for whoever has that catalog. So it's a way to transmit information without necessarily somebody, because I also have talked about how when you're in a restaurant, People that may not have uh, experience in cooking, they get to see how it's cooked, they see how it's managed, and then they think, okay, I can do this. I'm going to go, you know, 1,000 kilometers east to some small town, and I'm going to set up my own place. So you have lineages of where people learned their cooking, but now you also have a catalog with recipes. So if you have a little bit of information and you have that, way to go, right? You're ready to, to roll. So I, because this is, you know, an archives talk, I thought I need to bring in some local archival material. So this is, uh, so the next few slides are from the uh, Nanaimo Community Archives. So this is the Puss in Boots Cafe that was in Nanaimo's Chinatown. Um, the, it was listed in 1951 in the Vancouver Island uh, directory. And you can see that, you know, looking at the, the kinds of uh, items available, it's your standard Chinese Canadian, right? So breaded almond chicken, deep fried shrimp, steamed garlic sparrows, sweet, sweet, you gotta have sweet and sour, right? Um, and chopped sueys. And then if you're from Nanaimo, again, certain time and place, you talk about the rendezvous, everybody knew the rendezvous. So they had one part that was more coffee shop and the other, the dining under the stars. And it was the place to go. Um, whoops. I don't know why it just did a jump, but this is where I wanted to go anyways. So this is an example from the menu from 1980. It's celebrating the 24th anniversary. And you can again see you've got Chinese foods and you have English food. So uh, chow mein, oh, okay. I don't know why that's doing that. Okay, so it's got chow mein and sweet and sour, fried rice and chicken wing combo, and then the other side, breaded veal cutlet and, and roast uh, prime rib. And look at the price, $7.95 for first person's dinner, second person's dinner, $1.25. <laughs> what a deal. 
so that's 1980. And then here are, to, to show you that the restaurants that were catering to basically a, a white population, they knew their audience. They knew that they had to have Chinese food as well as, you know, European style food because one, okay. Do you know why it's constant? Yeah, just put that the timer between the slides, but I don't know why there'd be that on these. Um, I can probably restart and the mic, but it may not. Uh, I'll just do the, if people don't mind, I'll do the flip back and forth. Um, so you can see that in some cases, like, like one that's got veal cutlets, but it's also got chopped suey, sweet and sour, and chow mein, right? So the way for people to survive in the sort of economic climate is to make sure that something's available for everyone. Okay, we're way, okay, yeah back here. Okay, so, so this is the WK one. Um, and this one is a Christmas uh, special. And so one side is Chinese, one side it says American. And you can see what, like, like a really standard uh, Western kind of menu, including sandwiches, right? And on the Chinese side, you get your standard chop suey, chow mein, and even egg fu yang. So this one is a uh, 1960s combination menu. So this is what the exterior looked like. So this is what I remember in the, in the sense of what the signage was. And, you know, so that was considered one of the fancy dishes. This particular menu card is interesting for me because it's the only place that I've seen it says that the restaurant was established in 1917 because I don't read Chinese I haven't scoured uh, Chinese newspapers to see what there might be in terms of openings but it says 1917 that's really early on okay so in in the fine print it says 1917 um, and you can see what the specials cost. So anywhere from $1.95 to $4.50, right? And so I've got some other combination menus because this was in 2011. And it's a different kind of combination special because it says that if you order a particular number, this is what you can get as an add-on. And I still remember they have Chinese Chinese dishes that would raise eyebrows for those who don't see certain foods as being edible. So I, I know that I was with my cousin at this time and he got all excited because he could get duck chins and you're thinking do ducks have chins and are they edible they are <laughs> so a different way of you know it, it says something about the changing clientele and what they were willing to consume right so there's other items so on the other side it says jellyfish i don't know how many of you have eaten jellyfish uh, when you're in the markets, you can see the jellyfish packaged up so that you can purchase it and, you know, consume it at, in your own home. But for the average person, okay, so I have friends, they think they know how to eat Chinese food. And then you give them something like jellyfish and it's like, nah, it's not going to go because it's a texture thing. So, so one of the things about Chinese cuisine is there is taste, but there's also texture. So we comment on the texture, you know, like, is it the right texture? Is it really a little, like, it could be chewy, but is it too chewy? Is it the right kind of chewy, right? Or they say chewy, how crisp. And I think uh, for non-Chinese diners, crisp is not the same kind of crisp. So, and... Uh, Part of talking about sort of the, the changing sort of more Chinese-ness is 
how that gets translated into a more uh, smaller community. Like Vancouver is very different because of the very large population of people of Asian descent. So a variety of different uh, backgrounds, but this is from Nanaimo. So, so I will tell you that this restaurant no longer exists. And uh, so I was there when it opened and when it opened, I went there every week because it's like, it's not like your regular Chinese Canadian. So I was really interested to see what they had on their menu. So what sets this apart is that it is mostly Chinese, not so much Chinese Canadian. So you have beef brisket and pork belly. But I noticed that nowadays, in the last couple of years, you actually see pork belly being marketed. But in the past, you wouldn't see it, like I'm thinking of, uh, the grocery stores, they offer, you know, like the ones that have takeout foods, they have pork belly. But in the past, you would never see pork belly. Pork belly was something that you would expect to find in Chinatown. Like I said, this this restaurant did not last very long. The other uh, trend that I wanted to comment on is, so this is Asian Canadian Writers Workshop and Special Dinner 2003. Back in the day when you went to a banquet, it was mostly meat. And people would say, oh, where's the vegetables? So the vegetables would be decorating the plate. You know, like you would have whatever that meat protein thing is. And maybe you would have a ring of broccoli around it. And everybody was like, vegetables! And then all the vegetables would disappear. But this menu actually has vegetarian. So, so we don't think about, because nowadays, everybody thinks, of course, you would consider a vegetarian option or perhaps even a vegan option. But this 2003 was when I started, oh, wait a minute, you know, it's actually in our Chinese menus. So it's not just about having lots of meat to show abundance and basically wealth because meat costs more. So if you want to show off, you want to show, have it with lots of meat dishes. So this is one of the uh, items. And another early menu, and again, you see that it's in English. Uh, and in Vancouver, there is now a Saiwu. And so I took this off the website in 2016. It has a very different vibe. So if you look at it, it says Sai Wu, and it's got inner peace, culinary excellence, Wu Bar, right? So different vibe, also different kind of presentation, which one would expect. But one of the things in terms of more recent restaurants, they don't have menus or they do have menus and they're printing it off. And then they, that allows for a lot of change. So if, you, if you're a collector, if you didn't collect it off of the internet early enough, so like, because I was questioning how long Ting Shang would last because I thought it's too Chinese to survive in Nanaimo. I did, I pulled off of the internet all the pages of the menu just so that I would have it. I was also fortunate to, to be gifted a copy of the Ting Shang menu. But you think of a lot of restaurants today, they print off their menu and they stuff it into those, you know, plastic uh, file folder pieces. And then that's what you get. It's not the same as physically holding a menu and knowing that an artist actually produced the menu. <laughs> Uh, and there's more pictures because people don't recognize what the foods are. So very different. And part of presenting this uh, talk is to remind us how Chinese Canadian foods are actually part of Canada's roots. So I've got two uh, book covers here. One is very academic, Lily Cho's book, Eating Chinese, and then the more popular one, Anne Hui's Chop Suey Nation. So both of these are Canadian uh, authors' books. 
And the Chop Suey Nation really, it actually starts in Victoria and goes all the way out to Fogo Island. And the uh, eating Chinese is dealing more with, again, small town uh, restaurants. And in thinking about small town restaurants, uh, I give you, so we can copy this later and, and give you the, the links, but these are all available online. So they give you the backstory. You might have the menu, but what about the people? So these are about the people. And, and one of the things that I wanted to point out is Chinese cafes in rural Saskatchewan, that is in Outlook, Saskatchewan. So Chuck Kwan, he went back in for his Chinese restaurants, Canada, filmed the same fellow. Uh, so you've got sort of in the heyday and less heyday. Uh, and I included dreaming of a Jewish Christmas because that's a whole, another whole nother conversation. This, this is not attached to a specific Canadian restaurant, but what's open on Christmas day, Chinese restaurants. So, so the Jewish community and Chinese restaurants, they have a very close affinity and that's just the reminder of it. So it's not to say that this uh, particular story is from Canada, but it could be a Canadian story. So we got from a very early time period, uh, Chinese cafes in rural Saskatchewan from 1985 all the way to just this year, how specials, five episodes, okay? So this sort of comes to basically the, the end of my talk in the sense that the majority of my menus are available online. Uh, I think you've already got the URL available and that is the WK Gardens menu. So where do menus find a home in terms of an archive? I would argue that a single menu doesn't mean a lot, but when you have a collection, you start to see something about the patterns in terms of food. You learn something about the community because it's not just about the restaurants. Like how did people actually get there? What are the families? So think about how many stories that are tied to a Chinese restaurant. Disappearing Moon Cafe. How many of you recognize uh, the title? Okay. Okay, we're not doing a lit course, but but it is but it is a significant uh, fictional account, and it takes place in Vancouver. Uh, the I'm thinking of what is it? Uh, let's see. I think I wrote it down here. Um, Midnight at the Dragon Cafe. That's a uh, Judy Fong Bates again fiction. So restaurants and obviously menus are attached to many people's lives in terms of this earlier immigrant and maybe not so early immigrant population because it's a way for people to find employment and that's why those early chinese or even more recent immigrants find themselves stretched across canada economic opportunity so when you think about those ties to Canada, ties to specific locations in the sense of BC, because we're here uh, in this conversation with the friends of BC archives, that British Columbia is our, our, our focus as, as such. So where should a menu collection like mine go? Because I know of, so it's not like I've done the research, but I do know of two menu collections. One is at the Johnson and Wales uh, University in Providence, Rhode Island. And it has the, um, the Association for Restaurants, National Association for Restaurant Menus. So it's very specific. Then the University of Toronto Scarborough has the Harley Spiller collection. And 
I've met Harley. I met Harley before he became famous as a menu collector. His collection was bought by the U of T Scarborough. And I think it numbers like 4,000 items. Like he has a lot. So I went online to, to see what he had. And he only had one item from BC. And it was Ming's which means I have the largest collection of BC Chinese Canadian restaurants, you know, as, as far as I'm aware, right? Um, what does it mean to have menus in an archive? Should it be a local community archive? Should it be in a university special collection? Or should it be? in the BC archives. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Lim, for your, um, your very engaging talk. And I think you've given us resources, um, not only how to think about um, these objects as historical items, but also um, things that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives and the kinds of questions we can ask about documents we encounter day-to-day -day when we're eating out, um, not just at the archive, but you know, getting dinner. Um, before we move on to a uh, question period, I just want to point out that our uh, coffee has arrived. So if you are um, would like a cup of coffee or, or there's some treats back there too, unfortunately not Chinese food or a selection of Chinese green teas, but uh, nonetheless, please feel free to get up and help yourselves, those of you in the room, if you'd like, they're just in the back. Uh, yep. I, I just wanted to make a mention. Uh, in my bio, it said that uh, there was an exhibit called Dishing Up Memories. So I have a few items that were reproduced. So I have copies here. So if you want to take a closer look at some of the items that are in my collection, you can take a look at these because they're reproductions. So it's not like I'm asking you to disappear them. I do want them returned, but they're not the originals. So those can be looked at, maybe put it on the table or something. Sure, I'll put these on the table. And uh, we do have time for questions and answers. Um, if you're online, you can put uh, questions in the chat. Um, perhaps, uh, Kathleen or Katie, would one of you mind passing? It's okay to pass them around? Yeah. Or, yeah. And then I'll I'll be here to um, to take questions. So we'll start with one in the room, and then we'll go online. And I'll... I'll so there's three... For the questions that come online, just put them in the chat, and then I'll... Um, repeat them here so that everyone in the room and online hears the question. Mary, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Oh. Which made me have a little more understanding of it being Chinese culture. And my friends, my friends had some, it was all in Chinese, so they had to tell me what to do. So I'll just repeat back the comment uh, for those of you who are online who might not have heard it. Um, uh, but there was a comment just about the experience of being in a uh, in a restaurant situation when you're when you're the minority in the room. And in this case, uh, Mary's a white person, so it was being in a in a situation being the only white face in the room and reflecting on what that experience might be like on the inverse. I don't know if you want to respond to that or have something to add. Um, well, I guess I could say is I'm I'm glad you had that revelation because it it is perhaps a shock to an individual to recognize what it might be like, well, especially I'm thinking in the earliest days of immigration, if you were that one quote unquote Chinese family or Japanese or black family in a small community and you couldn't find the food <laughs> and you couldn't explain to others how you felt about things yeah so i you know i it's it's hard to respond because i've experienced it so often being the only one like i've i've gone to conferences 
and, and I enter and they say, oh, you must be Imogene. And then I realize I'm the only one who has a non-Anglo-Saxon name. So they assume that somebody who looks non-white, or it, it must be that person, right? So how is it that everybody knows my name and I don't know them? It's because of how I look. Back. Have you studied or have any insight on who was, like, how the population was changed from going to restaurants? Because obviously there's probably different people, like who was going to restaurants in the 20s versus current day? Presumably that's changed quite a bit. I mean, probably there wasn't a lot of restaurant competition in the 20s, or I mean, they showed up a, a menu that it's Chinese menu and it's in English. So obviously is that was it mainly favoring the Chinese or were those other populations coming? So the question, I, I'll just repeat back for those of you who are online, is about how the populations of people who are coming to these restaurants have changed from that early menu in the 1920s and, until now. So one of the things about, is certainly Vancouver's Chinatown, it was in some ways viewed as an entertainment district. So people, so it wasn't just for Chinese people, it was for non-Chinese and it offered you know a sense of adventure for some people it's like oh we went to chinatown it was a big deal and now because uh, chinese cuisine is basically available in a large metropolitan area you know in every community it's when you go to those small towns you realize that um the kind of cuisine being offered is reminiscent of the 50s, 60s. It's not the, or, or or I should say, it might have some of those quote unquote newer items, the spicier foods, you know, the Sichuan, Hunan kind of thing. Because in my growing up, it was Cantonese food. There was no, as I said, the spicy stuff because that's not Cantonese food. So, so there has been a change in population and here in uh, the sort of uh, Metro Vancouver, there are so many, okay, let me backtrack. Being of Chinese descent means many different things because people came th through different waves of immigration. So I am what I would call a low Waku family. So low, old, Waku, overseas Chinese family. So I know that both on both sides of my family, they came either in, okay, so, so my grandfather Lim, he came in 1890. He paid a head tax. I know on my mother's side, my uh, grandmother came in 1912. I haven't been able to find when my grandfather arrived in, the grandfather Chan arrived in B.C., so people's ideas of who they are are very different than people who came in the 60s and 70s who were part of that um, newer wave because immigration changed in the mid-late 60s. So I think it's 67 specifically. So you got different people coming. And then uh, before the return of Hong Kong, another wave of migration. So people came from very different backgrounds. And that also is a factor in the kinds of foods. So one of the things that I say, I am of peasant stock and I'm proud of it. I'll just pop in if I may with some, uh, some comments and questions online and then we'll return to the room. Um, there uh, is a comment from one person uh, saying that they saw on your... Um, on the menu with uh, Prime Minister Lester Pearson was uh, S.W. Leung, and who was the GP of the person on Zoom, apparently. Oh, um, nice. so we, we they were the, one of the people that was seen on the menu with um, with Lester Pearson was the the GP 
a general practitioner, presumably, of one of their online attendees. There's also a couple of people um, who are commenting about special um, menu collections they know of, one at McGill University. Um, they're not sure how large it is in their special collections. And another one at um, University of Toronto Scarborough, I believe. Yes. Okay, the Har the, Har the Harley Spiller, exactly. Um, and then the U of T's Fisher Rare Book Collection has an uncaught, uncatalogued Mary Williamson uh, menu collection from 1860 to 2006, but there's only one Chinese food uh, restaurant on the menu. Um, one question uh, was if any of your family members are still in the restaurant business. The answer is no. <laughs> uh, any more questions from in person? Then we'll go back to online. I, I saw this person first. No, I'm on the menu. It's dine and dance. I forgot all about going to a restaurant for a social evening and not only dining, but having an opportunity to dance as well. So, so 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 the question was about uh dining and dancing that uh we today we think of just dining, but we don't think of it being entertainment. Like it's a it's a social thing, right? And and now when you go to a restaurant, more than likely people are on their phones while they're eating, right? Not even conversing with one another. But back in the day, you dined and it was really about the company, right? It's it's a social occasion. So one of the things about the WK Gardens that was at 127 East Pender that I remember as part of my childhood is it had a horsehair sprung dance floor, the same as the Commodore in Vancouver. So you could dance the night away and not have any problems the next day. And they had a band. So I actually have some photographs of the uh, Blue Bow Band. Uh, they had a little combo and some of the uh, early documentation, it says dining until 4 a.m. Oh, go ahead. I'll just pack, pop back to online for a question. Um, well, it's, it's actually an observation about uh, how um, demographics change and menus change over time. And the observation is that pork belly used to be um, plentiful because it was cheap and unwanted. Um, I think that means by society at large or by white society. Um, but now it's become, you know, it's hip and it's, it's, it's shishi and is therefore no longer cheap. So I don't know if you want to offer a comment about that. Well, there is some truth about, uh, you know, what was undesirable uh, becoming more desirable because I think for most people, uh, again, I'm looking at the audience and the sort of age bracket. Uh, some of you might remember that eating chicken wings was sort of like the cheaper meat. And now chicken wings are a thing because we got buffalo wings, right? Uh, which means everybody wants wings. So there are still foods that uh, are perceived as less desirable. I'm thinking things like um, back in the day, certainly I ate this as a kid, is beef tongue. So it's not specifically Chinese, I'm just saying as, as a food. And people still don't view it as a desirable food. So, so if you think about all the different kinds of foods that people turn their noses up, there, we actually do have more food to go around than less. It's like, what, what do we call edible? Which is another whole discussion because one of the things is I also teach food and culture. So, 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 so you know, food, food is not just about the menus, it's about the whole, the whole thing. Wondering uh, when did the WK Gardens close? Is there is there still a Chinese restaurant in that location now? And did the de did the neon sign end up somewhere? I'm sure the neon. Oh, okay. the The question was uh, asking about uh, the restaurant, the WK Gardens, whether there was still a restaurant and when it ended. Uh, so the restaurant ended when there was a big fire. So that was in, I think it was mid, early to mid seventies. So I don't know what happened to the sign uh, because I know a number of signs ended up with collectors, which means 
signs, if you're collecting neon signs, you must have a big storage. <laughs> it's not a shed, a storage building, right? No, I haven't seen that. And so like even uh, in Nanaimo, the diner's rendezvous sign is like classic. It's very distinctive. And I remember hearing that somebody offered to take it off their hands and away it went. So I don't know whether any money was exchanged, but it's disappeared. And who knows whether it's, uh, you know, it can be uh, reserviced to be made usable again. I have no idea. Um, as to restaurants, so the building uh, burnt down and it was restored. Uh, so there is, so so it still has the date on it, uh, and it did have a restaurant on the second floor. But the the last of the WK Garden, so there's a story behind, you know, like how that particular WK Garden ended. Uh, my father at some point reopened a WK at the location where Asia Gardens uh, was. And currently there is a Dollarama there. And for those who don't know uh, Chinatown history, prior to the Asia Gardens, and I'm not 100% sure whether there was a restaurant prior to the Asia Gardens, it was a bowling alley. One interesting comment online here from um, someone. Um, they say, as a child in the 1940s, my dad used to trap pigeons and sell them to restaurants in Vancouver Chinatown, um, which they served as a squab. Uh, and he was later, the, the dad was later a waiter at WK Gardens um, working for Harold Lim. So Harold Lim is my uncle. <laughs> and he's the one that I am thankful for having uh, many of the menus. And I do remember eating squabs. It was a thing. <laughs> and they were very tasty. And just a question as well. You, you, you referenced this a bit at the end of your talk, but um, the question is how you feel about the shift uh, from uh, physical menus to QR codes are becoming popular. Um, and whether you've seen that in Chinese restaurants and um, how you feel about it, and then how that might impact the archiving and preserving that history. Uh, so QR codes, I haven't uh, gone to any restaurants. And I, I will say that part of the collecting has to do with my own um, preference for restaurants because uh, many of the, you know, lightweight paper stuff that I've picked up is because I've gone to that restaurant. So it says something about my own dining habits or where I end up because there's a special occasion. So, so when I go to those functions and they have the little menu on the top of the table, they're mine. <laughs> it's like first dibs. So uh, that becomes part of my collection because usually it has a date, it has uh, what the event is and it has the menu item. So it gives me a sense of, you know, if this is a fundraiser dinner, it's not gonna be the same as a banquet, wedding banquet dinner, right? So I have some sense of the cost of food. So you can figure out, yes, this truly is a fundraiser because it's not a lot of food. <laughs> um, but the QR code, uh, one of the things about menus, the, the ones that I have in my collection, it's set the weight of the menu. So you know that there was care and thought in presentation. When it's a QR code, okay, you plug it in and a QR code pops out. If somebody is not actually tracking that restaurant, those menus disappear. So, the, so we don't have any record of them unless, what is it? Uh, Internet Archive takes a, a screenshot, so I don't know, how, you know, wh whether they actively uh, scour the internet for restaurant menus. But because, so like I said, I was interested in in the ones in Nanaimo. Sometimes I get interested in them, and then I sort of track them. So I copy, you know, so I down <laughs> meticulously down, <laughs> cut and paste, cut and paste, so that I have a record of what they're offering. So we miss out on something when it's just a QR code. So, so one of the things that I like about some of the menus I have, 
you can see food stains, right? <laughs> and some of the older ones, you can see that there's little pencil marks. So that suggests that a particular item was popular because, you know, so, so probably somebody was taking the, the menu order and they're just making a little tick. Okay, that's, that's the one that people like, right? So there's additional information that may not necessarily be apparent in a digital scan. Just from the comments, I was very interested in hearing about the attending to the rules of Saskatchewan. In the early 70s, I actually spent a summer working on farms in outside of Outlook. Okay. And we ate every evening in the cafe because he'd remain open until 2 a.m. for the farm. Huh. And his daughter would serve me. And it was so funny because I worked with a lot of University of Saskatchewan and uh, agriculture students. And they were always questioning these young girls where did you get your Texas draw? And they fall for it. They go, we all have a draw. <laughs> <laughs> There's a comment about eating at um our Chinese restaurants in rural Saskatchewan where they would stay open late so that the farm workers could come in and eat there. So I, I think that really says something about the relationships of small town, in this case, Chinese restaurants with the community. So in many of those small town communities, this was before there were, you know, fast food outlets. They were the hub. They were the place that people went to, to just hang out. So if you look at um, that uh, first uh, one, the Chinese cafes in rural Saskatchewan, you can see, so it's referencing the person they called Noisy Jim. So he would open up at 6 a.m. and people would be having coffee there. And it's it's clear there was a very close sense of community they you know it it was like what you would call the third place you know there's home and then there was that place you know work and then that place you've been waiting patiently in the back there go ahead meeting of the culture there was sportsmen and the Chinese, um, the chef in the Chinese restaurant. So in the mornings, the men would bring in their, their um, duck breasts and go back and eat the evening for dinner. And the teapots may or may not have had whiskey. Special <laughs> tea. So it was, it was a, a great relationship, and I heard many stories about uh -huh. those nights. Mm -hmm. Another comment about um, rural menus, and in particular, the uh, the interface between duck hunters uh, and the Chinese restaurants that would, would they purchase the ducks from the from the hunters? I'm guessing. Yeah. But they, they would pay, pay to prepare the food. Right, so they'd bring the ducks in and they, they would prepare them, yeah. So, uh, you know, again, it's it's about relationships. And so, so when you're in the city, you don't see that kind of relationship. It's in the small towns that uh, you have, uh, you know, special meals because somebody brought in a fresh duck or, you know, maybe it would be a fresh water fish and they would prepare it, right? So relations like this and uh, the comment about tea. So... In the early days when there was uh, perhaps no liquor license, it was a common notion that there could be had special tea. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, you and the Miss Better. Western and that standard Chinese um, Chinese dishes, and we would go to the fanciest of weddings in New York City to get their pigeon, their frog's legs, their rabbits, and their fish eyes, and all those delicacies. Because you wouldn't really see frog's legs and those kinds of things growing up, but at home we would get some of that. Uh, 
Rogers. Uh, so there's a comment about growing up in Kingston and how there used to be uh, Chinese restaurants on just about every block. And uh, that, that split between the, the, the Canadian and the Chinese parts of the menu. So I guess the other thing to comment is, and I don't, can't remember whether I did this uh, when I've traveled across Canada, but when, so I did, I did my uh, doctoral studies in the United States and I remember go going into some restaurants and I would say, I don't want what, what's on the menu. I want what you would serve your family. And then you would get not the Chinese Canadian or Chinese American equivalent. You would get something a little bit different and it would be probably homestyle cooking. So I, I see that even uh, on the, you know, like there's one restaurant in Shimanis and I've seen the family eating. It's like, they don't have that on the menu. I recognize what they're eating, but they don't have that on the menu. So uh, depending on your relationship, you probably could ask for something special. Wanted to bring it back to Saskatchewan. <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to thank you for explaining the WK and what it meant because there's a WK garden in Regina that, that I know, and and, uh, and it, it's interesting to understand how that works. So thank you. And the family picture as well, uh, early on in the presentation, because when I'm from Saskatchewan, every fall after harvest, uh, my grandfather and family would all get dressed up very fancy and go to the Arbor Room, which is upstairs at the National Cafe in Nusha for, for Chinese food. And, and I have a family picture taken at the restaurant, not as nice as yours, but uh, it brought back a lot of memories to see that. So thank you. So another memory about, well, uh, first about WQ and where that where that word, w sorry, WK, thank you. Um, and it's WQ is what, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what that stands for, and and that seeing that elsewhere, and that was in Saskatchewan as well, right? Um, and then about photographs and and how um, these become important gathering places and places where we remember certain events. So that early photograph was the marriage of my uncle. So it's got uh, Chan family relatives, and I don't know whether my cousin is online. I I know he was sent the link. He's he's in Calgary, uh, so friend from Calgary sent the link to my cousin and he's in that photograph. So if he's online, maybe he recognizes himself in that photograph, but it, it was a wedding. Um, and that's why everybody was as dressed up as they were. Oh, he is. Okay. <laughs> so you saw yourself, Len. <laughs> And during the 60s, if you went to the cave supper club or the panorama room or any of the other what they call supper clubs along Richard Street, afterwards, when they had closed, you would go to Chinatown for dinner. And uh, frequently you would find the entertainers there who would entertain you earlier in the evening. You could not eat at these places. They're there with you having a late dinner. It's very much a, a mixing of more than the Chinese. European culture, Afro Americans, as well. So, a comment about in Vancouver about um, going from supper clubs earlier in the evening and then to uh, Chinese restaurants later in the evening, um, but also sort of racial restrictions around um, uh, the African uh, performers who would be um, in some of these supper clubs, but not actually able to dine alongside the eaters. So, that's very true. And I had said earlier how that. Vancouver's Chinatown was an entertainment district. So there's the dining and dancing, but also another reason to stay open until four o'clock in the morning is because the Granville Street hubs would uh, close down and you know people needed food. And there's uh, a photograph. I don't know whether it's still up, but uh, they had, um, what is it? Um, images of early... Chinatown on a number of windows. And there was one with uh, Wang Funxin and Lena Horn. So, so Lena Horn dined in Chinatown. And, and one of the things that I remember 
uh, being told. So I don't have this, but during WK's heyday, apparently my father got Gary Cooper's autograph because he dined at the WK. So, so reputedly my sister has that autograph. I've never seen it, but reputedly she has it. And I know that, you know, listening to the conversation, Frank Sinatra will go to the WK. Prince Philip ate at the WK. So, so the Chinese restaurants were not the kind of Chinese restaurants people think of today. They were it places to go and to be seen. We have time for maybe a couple of more questions and comments. I'm, I'm just going to read a comment from um, somebody who's attending online saying, thank you for a very interesting talk. I have eaten at scores of Chinese restaurants in Saskatchewan. We're picking up on a theme here. Um, while I was traveling in the province, they were a lifesaver, often the only restaurant in town. As the only Chinese family in town, it was in some senses a lonely life. Many of the restaurants began following the building of the railroad when the Chinese men had to find another way to live. There are fewer of them now as Chinese families have more options and the current generation doesn't want to follow as restrictive a life as their parents and grandparents. Thanks again. So one of the things about uh, sort of, uh, I guess it was tied to an earlier comment uh, question about, is there any family still in the restaurant business? So my recollection of my father while he was in the restaurant business is I never saw him. Right. So he he would leave first thing in the morning before I was awake because he would have to go to the produce places or the meat places to get the ingredients. And as I said, you know, like at one point in time, the WK was open to four o'clock in the morning. Uh, I think when there was uh, less interest in the sort of dining entertainment aspect, just the food, it's just like, you know, like during the peak of the pandemic, if the restaurants were open, they only open till what, eight o'clock or whatever, instead of maybe the 10 o'clock that they might've opened earlier. So, so people adjusted the time according to the patrons that were uh, going to the restaurants. <laughs> we are bringing back the dine and dance. Yeah, a question in the front row here. Okay, so the question was was about uh, particular types of foods being offered. And I think you said egg foo young? Sweet and sour. Oh, changing prices. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, that wouldn't mean be my prime interest if I was going to do a, a more work on it. What I would be interested in is, so because I had the, that 1920 something uh, WK chop suey, it had listed dainty eggs. And I'm thinking, how did we get dainty eggs? But if you look at what's listed under dainty eggs, it's egg foo young. So how do you get from dainty eggs to egg foo young? So, so I'm curious as to uh, the naming of certain kinds of foods, right? Or when they appear. So uh, we had talked earlier about pork belly, how pork belly is something that you might see in other kinds of restaurants and not restricted to Chinese. And and I know that that's relatively recent because I, you know, because I'm a conscientious shopper, I flip through all those food flyers and I see, oh, they're serving pork belly, you know? So that's a, that's a relatively, yeah, it's So, 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 so the picture looks like suyuk, but it's a relatively recent thing in a Western grocery store flyer. I know in some of the earlier ones, they say dainty eggs. So if you're making egg foo young, are you going to be cracking open all little quail eggs? I don't think so. No, no, the title of the item was dainty eggs. So, so, you know, you have the noodles as a category, dainty eggs was a category. So that, that, that interests me as to how we got 
Like where do dainty eggs come from? And because I don't read Chinese, I don't know whether it has something to do with the Chinese term. So last question before we wrap up uh, here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, somebody invented the Chinese sand. Yeah. So I a question about the chow mein sandwich. So you said chow mein sandwich. Okay. So 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 what people don't in this room don't know is I I am the chow mein sandwich queen. So uh, back in the day uh, when I completed my doctorate, I ended up getting a postdoctoral fellowship. And I became aware of the chow mein sandwich that is available. It's not just available, but it was notable in Fall River, Massachusetts. And the so it is what it sounds like. It's a starch on starch item. So it's chow mein between a bun, a hamburger bun, or uh, that nice square white bread. Okay, so... The way that I describe it is, so if you look, again, context matters. So if you think about Fall River, Massachusetts, which you don't know about, it was a textile mill town and it was very Catholic. So each, uh, there was multiple parishes. So you had the Italians, you had the Polish, you had the Francophone. So each of these parishes would have their Chinese restaurant. So if you were serving Chinese food to immigrants that don't know what Chinese food is, they know what a sandwich is and you can put chow mein in it. Mm -hmm. And so, so some of those textile mills actually would have chow mein sandwiches served as part of the, you know, like the, their lunch program. And I remember, oh, I have to tell you, there is in fact a chow mein sandwich song sung by Alika and the Happy Samoans, which again marks a particular time period of, you know, pseudo Chinese Polynesian food. Uh, so the chow mein sandwich, you could get it with chicken. So it would be chicken chow mein said, but basically it was vegetarian. So being Catholic, meatless Fridays, the school served chow mein sandwiches, which meant that if you were growing up in a particular time and place, chow mein sandwiches identified you in terms of your growing up period. So during the, I think it was the, I'm thinking what, what time period it was, during one of the um, Persian Gulf conflicts, when the US military had their boats out there, they had people from Fall River having the chow mein being shipped in so that people could make chow mein sandwiches. So people identify it. It's, it's, it's an identity thing. It's about Fall River, but it's also about how they saw Chinese food. So Chinese food has a lot of meaning. And I think that's a great uh, note to end it on. You've made an eloquent case for why we should consider these um uh, items of real historic significance, but I also I think in both in your talk, the comments online and in the room, clearly this is a, a, a topic that like all of us have a very personal connection to, which I think is also a great um, case for why this is a, these are records of, of, of historic and also really national significance, not just Chinese history, but this is really about Canadian history and North American history. Um, Thank you everyone um, online and in person for attending this event hosted by the Friends of the BC Archives. Um, if you are a member, thank you for your support. If you're not a, a member, there are um, signs or there are forms in the back if you'd like to become a member for as low as $15. Um, and you can also find information about that on our website. Our annual general meeting will be held on November 1st. It's a Wednesday. And that's a really good time to become acquainted with our organization and, um, and to help support the kind of work we're doing. Um, there will also be an event 
um, on November 19th um, in person, and we'll have an online segment or option as well, um, screening a film called Unarchived by the National Film Board, which fe features Dr. Imogene Lim. Yeah. And I, and I do want to make a point that Unarchived received uh, Heritage BC's award, outstanding award for education and communication. So it's a must-see film. So come back here and come back here and uh, and see it. And again, it, it also considers these these questions about what what get, makes it into archives and and, and not, which is a, a great interest to us as an organization. Um, so with all that being said, um, coffee in the back. Feel free to stick around, have a snack and and drink. And let's thank Dr. Imogene Lim one more time. Thank you so much.